Uh, welcome to this event. And first of all, please join me thanking Greg Payne, uh, Spencer Kimball, our whole team from Boston, students included, and staff who came here and helped organize this event. Thank you all for the amazing work that you did uh, putting together this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight as we get ready to participate in this incredible event and engage in dialogue and conversation with this group and this whole group included here about political communication and polling. Uh, this event and this discussion perfectly match our mission and our goals as a school of communication, which include facilitating dialogue about important and timely issues in, in a thoughtful, insightful way. That's the best way to do it. I want to extend a special welcome to our SOC students currently living and studying here in the Washington program. Thank you for being here tonight uh, as part of our Emerson DC program that we are trying to grow and establish even better, uh, a bigger program in Washington DC. So this is, initiative is part of that. Uh, and to our alumni living and working in the DC area, we really appreciate that you're here tonight. We are very proud of your accomplishments and very happy that you all made it uh, to this event. Please remember that you're welcome to come back to Boston to our campus at any time. You always have a place in Boston and we will welcome you with open arms. Thank you all for being here. Greg? Thank you. Thank you, Raul. It's great to be back in DC after a global summit last year with Blancarna and to bring back some of the people who joined us at the nation's capital for an exciting dialogue. When I look at the panel and look at those present, one thing that I'm excited about to echo Raul is the excellence in communication and leadership that we see our graduates actually exhibiting in political communication, ethics, and in communication. If I look at this panel, we have Larry Rasky, uh, who is a distinguished alumni as well as trustee. Uh, he's someone who has tremendous experience in the area of political communication. Uh, he has run uh, Joe Biden's campaign and is also going to be in charge of the PAC, so we're very happy to have him. Another individual who is a an alum of us and also someone who was during, during the first class in Los Angeles, a part of that is Susan Del Percio. Many of you see her as the moderate Republican voice on Morning Joe. Morning. We have Susan Del Percio, we have Larry Rasky, Cheryl Jackson, Spencer Kimball, and Kathy Kendall. Kathy Kendall was actually my master's advisor at SUNY Albany back in the day. Um, and I think Kathy is going to give us uh, an overview of the history of uh, primary campaigns. She's been on the field in New Hampshire, in fact, one of the, the leading scholars in the field of communication uh, in some of her historical work for years. She's been on the campaign trail uh, walking through New Hampshire, and you've been to Iowa too, I believe. Uh, but uh, so Kathy's going to lead us off with uh, a history. Uh, I'm going to allow the panelists uh, a few minutes to introduce their topic, and then we may probe some questions of them. But then we'll also have some questions for those of you in the audience uh, who have just pressing uh, questions for our uh, panelists. Thanks, John. Uh I wanted to hold up a, a copy of the Washington Post today, and I, and I think that we can credit, we assume that, that Emerson College is involved in reaching the Washington Post and getting a story that's directly related to this uh, event tonight. It says, poll, primary race still up in the air. And it's the lead story in the Washington Post. And that's tonight's topic, of course, the primaries, or at least the, uh, the primaries as they lead up into the election uh, a year from now. How did we get such a strange and unique system for nominating presidential candidates? Let me, let me tell you how. Um, the presidential primaries had at least two founding fathers. They were both Republicans, Senator Robert M. La Follette of Wisconsin and former President Teddy Roosevelt. Both ran for the Republican nomination in the primaries of 1912. Senator La Follette was a major instigator of progressive uh, reforms such as the presidential primary. 
The goal of the primary was to give more power to the party members at the grassroots and to take away or reduce the power of what has been called over the ages, the men in the smoke-filled room. Teddy Roosevelt saw that the primaries were a way to oust the Republican, he was a Republican, but he wanted to oust the incumbent Republican and he thought he could do this in the primaries. The incumbent was William Howard Taft, President William Howard Taft. There were at least 12 primaries in 1912. They're uncertain about the number because it was so new. They didn't, the definition was very vague. And Roosevelt did win most of those primaries, but the Republican Party nominated Taft. And we all know the history that Taft bolted the party and ran in a third party. And then, of course, that split the Republican Party. And in the fall, a Democrat won uh, and named uh, Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey. Now, from 1912 through 1968, about a third of the states used primaries, and they were mainly an advisory role. Not unimportant, but advisory to the men in the smoke-filled room who still decided who the nominee would be. All that changed in 1972. The leader was Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. The Democratic Party had created a commission called the McGovern-Fraser Commission, and the purpose was to develop new rules to assure that there be more grassroots support, um, more grassroots participation in the selection of the nominee. And from that commission, the states adopted primaries and, and caucuses, and by 1972, uh, most of the, the majority of the delegates at the convention were selected that way rather than at, at the convention itself. Now there are lessons that we can learn from the early primaries that still resonate today. First, the party heads still have real power, even though the, the purpose was to give the power to the grassroots. Just look at the power of the Republican uh, Party, for example, the Republican National Committee and the Republican State Committees. Uh, which have canceled Republican primaries in five states. Alaska, Arizona, Kansas, South Carolina, and Nevada will not have primaries. Look at the power of the Democratic National Committee, which has organized and set the rules for the 10 presidential debates. Some people get to take part in them, some people do not. Second, the fact that there are multiple, and I think this multiplicity of primaries and candidates. These are, this is really vital in changing, making the primaries have a special influence. The order of the primaries propels the candidates. In 1912, the first primary was in North Dakota, and La Follette won. Nobody expected that. They all expected either Teddy Roosevelt, famous pre former president, or the incumbent president, William Howard Taft, to win the Republican primary in North Dakota, but La Follette was there, he campaigned, nobody else campaigned. Lesson, big lesson, be there. Be there and get out there and campaign and do it early. And you can see our candidates doing that today. Where are they campaigning? In the four states that hold primaries or caucuses in February. Uh, New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, and Nevada. Third, the, the fact that there are multiple candidates, it really changes the communication dynamics of this whole situation. It's hard for the same uh, candidates in the same party to stand out clearly. Right now we have 16 candidates still running. And how do they, who remembers who the specific health proposal of those 16 candidates. Maybe you remember a little bit, maybe it's their first version, maybe it's their second version. It's very hard to remember that, there's so many candidates. We do though, in contrast, remember Andrew Yang's promise to have a, a give $1,000 a month of income to everyone. He has a unique proposal and in a huge crowd that stands out. With multiple candidates, another situation arises. When you only have two in, in the fall, it's different. All right, you have the uh, difficult questions and confrontational uh, approach that's being used by the candidates who are not 
front runners. In 1972, Senator George McGovern was not running, uh, it was not a front runner at all in the early primaries. He released his tax records and the list of his donors, and he demanded that all the other candidates do that. The front runners ignored him at first. Who's this senator from North Dakota, you know, you know, or South Dakota? Uh, and then he kept pressing. It got to be embarrassing. It looked like they were hiding something. And eventually they, most of them did release. But th all of this was pressure from a candidate who was not running high. It was not a front runner. In the fourth presidential primary debate this October, something like this happened. Remember that Mayor uh, Buttigieg and Senator Klobuchar both pressured uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. How is she going to pay for her health care plan? Tell America where you're going to get send the invoice, said Klobuchar. The confrontational exchanges gave Buttigieg and Klobuchar extensive media coverage and a bump in the polls. Fourth, there is recurring language in the primaries that you see through history. Candidates want to be seen as fighters and winners. The top priority right now with most uh, Democratic voters is defeating Donald Trump. Vice President Biden combines both the fighter and the winner language when he says, I will beat him like a drum. So you look at the word, the meaning of beat, it really has both the fighter and the uh, winner. Senator Harris's language casts her as a fighter who has taken on, quote, the bad guys. Senator Klobuchar constantly men mentions she's a winner. She's won every race, quote, every place, including in Trump-supporting areas. These are from fundraising letters. Fifth, primary candidates of the past often achieved surprising success and stayed in the campaigns long before, long beyond what you expected by using uh, new technologies. McGovern's 1972 campaign, for example, used direct mail a lot. That was new at the time. It was very successful for him. Governor Jerry Brown ran in 92. He used economical methods of running. Low, low price cable in states, for example. And he always gave his 1-800 number at the end of every speech and message and provided that in his ads. Very cheap, very effective. Kept him in the race long beyond much more, at much more prominent candidates. In 2016, the sheer size of Donald Trump's Twitter following gave him a clear advantage. I'm wondering what the innovations are, or what they will be this year. This year, there are some unique features in the primaries, new aspects. There are sev several women, not just one. There are candidates from a variety of, of different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. There's a candidate who is a homosexual in a gay marriage. This is the first time that a mayor has been near the top ranks of the candidates, though there was another mayor who ran and got very little attention in 1992, Larry Agran, who is the mayor of Irvine, California. We may see that the impeachment trial will affect this, uh, these primaries, it's particularly if the Senate is voting at the time that candidates, six senators running, they might want to be out there in those early candidate, early uh, primary states, and they'll be torn, they have to vote in the Senate at the same time. Finally, realize that the primaries are a marathon that seem to go on forever, and, but really nothing really counts until the votes in the primaries. Votes make a dramatic impression. Some candidates will drop out immediately after Iowa or after New Hampshire. I promise you will not be bored by the presidential primaries. Remember, Truth is stranger than fiction and a thousand times more interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, panelists, is there a set order or should we just make our way down the, the dais, if you will? All right, Spencer. Um, it's always nice to hear from Professor Kendall. We use her book in our class. Um, though she forgot about Mayor Giuliani, but I guess a lot of people did in 08. Um, 
So we were looking at uh, some polls this week, and uh, we're going to share a couple of them with you right now, and then we'll have a chance to discuss them. And one of them is in the key state, the silver state of Nevada. And Nevada is going to be that third state that comes in after Iowa and New Hampshire. And so for the Democrats, it's very important uh, because you're going to have Super Tuesday in two weeks, and you've got to still be in the race. So the early results in our polls looks with Joe Biden ahead by about seven or eight points. He's right around that 28% uh, mark. And then you've got Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren competing out in Nevada with him. Um, and then there's a, a, a real drop there. You don't see Mayor Pete doing as well there as we saw him maybe a couple weeks ago in Arizona being a little bit more competitive. So we see Pete as he's growing in Iowa looking to use that as a springboard into New Hampshire and potentially down to Nevada. But remember, Nevada is a caucus state, and that means it takes a lot of organization to win that state. Uh, and then the other, the other state that we looked at, um, well, I will say from a general election, because we get to talk about two things tonight. We're one year out from the general election, but about 90 days out from the first primary, the caucus. So in that general election, when we look at Nevada, that's a state I think both Republicans and Democrats are going to look at in 2020. Uh, the Silver State's got six electoral votes, and this might offset some of the losses that uh, the Republicans might see in some states that they were able to take in 2016. So that was very interesting to see in that poll. We also took a look at the state of Michigan because people saw Michigan as kind of the first crack or the, a, a major crack in that blue wall that was going to hold Clinton or, or propel Clinton to the White House. And what we see up there is a, is a very strong showing in the Democratic side. It seems as if the Gretchen Whitmore victory, even the Stabenow victory in her Senate race, seems to have solidified that, that blue base in Michigan but what's interesting is against Elizabeth Warren, Trump trails by six, seven points. Against Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden, that number jumps to like 14, 13, 14 points. And the question will be who gets that nomination and what will happen in that general election. Now, what's interesting with Michigan, if you recall it in 2016, it was that big surprise where Bernie was able to win that primary, even though he was trailing by literally like 14, 15 points in the polls, he won it and kind of revived his campaign. He's still in that fight. Uh, we see him and Joe Biden again, Biden leading the pack, but Bernie Sanders being very close there, and then Elizabeth Warren trailing a little bit further behind. So that's a little bit of a dynamic of what we've been seeing and look forward to being able to talk more about the races. Great, thank you, Spencer. Susan. So I have a confession to make. Today I put a countdown app until election day, 2020. I'm really tired already. <laughs> It's going to be a long year, but um, it's going to, and it's going to be a challenging year, which is, I thought, really depressing in a lot of ways until I came and spoke to so many of you today, because you all kind of give me a little hope. You've lived through this election, the last election cycle, which was probably the most ugly and divisive race we've ever seen, it. and hopefully, I don't think we'll, I can say it'll be the last one, because we have one in 2020, but it, it, the fact that you're all so into what you're doing, and a lot has to do with public service and being po aware politically and, and trying to do something meaningful, is so great to see. Um, when I graduated Emerson in 1991 with my graduate work, I just kind of thought it was fun to do. And I got involved in politics, and then I got involved in government, and then I started my own firm. But there was no it, need as we have right now, to have younger people like yourselves coming up and really getting involved in understanding the process. So that was, while I put the countdown app on my, my phone this morning, I'm really just so happy to see you guys and hear from what you're all doing, because that is inspirational. Um, and you're going to need it, because you're going to see a lot of ugliness in the next year. There's primaries, there's general elections, and it will be challenging. but. You all just have to keep doing what you do, and that's staying aware and listening and challenging people when they say things, because there's a lot of people out there who just make a lot of noise, and we need to hold them accountable. You guys are the best. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my name is Larry Rasky. I'm an Emerson grad, 1978, although I always forget whether I graduated in 77 or 78. That's uh, the privilege of being as old as I am. But um, in 1976, when I was attending Emerson College, I had a part-time job as a security guard. 
um, in an office building down the block from the school. And there was a guy running for president that year by the name of Jimmy Carter. And he uh, moved his office for his Massachusetts campaign into the building where I was a security guard. And four years later, I was deputy press secretary for the re-election of President Jimmy Carter. And that is my origin story of my career in politics and, um, and why my first message to every kid that comes in to see me is keep your eyes open and talk to everybody because you, you never know where your opportunity is gonna come from. Um, I've had a wonderful career since I've left Emerson and I've been on the board for 17 years at Emerson. But um, in 1986, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a fellow by the name of Joe Biden, who was an aspiring young senator at the time, thinking about running for president of the United States. Um, and I must say, for me, when I went to see Joe Biden speak for the first time, it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I had never seen anything quite like Joe Biden. He was, um, in his time, the most dynamic speaker um, that you could ever be in a room with and just a wonderful person. And so it's odd being with, still being Joe's friend and seeing him being criticized for being the old guy in the race, um, but still knowing him as I do because I went on to be his communications director when he ran for president in 1987, and then ran again in 2007. I took a leave of absence from the company I run in Boston, and a leave of absence from my service as a trustee of the Emerson Board to spend the year traveling with Biden in 87. Um, 87, I mean 2007. 2007 turned out to be an interesting campaign. Some of you, may remember this, you kids probably don't, um, but there was a very hot young candidate by the name of Barack Obama who was uh, winding his way through the polls. Um, and I don't want to be critical of Mayor Pete, but I will say that by this time in 2007, Barack Obama was already at 22% in the polls not at 9%, and um, trailing Hillary Clinton by about five points. But when we started, Barack Obama really was, you know, kind of an afterthought. Um, and Joe was competing with, you know, well, people, Hillary Clinton. And, um, but on the opening day of our campaign, the story got published where Joe Biden characterize Barack Obama, he thought, favorably as, and I quote, clean and articulate. And, you know, so you looked at that quote and you said, well, what is that? You know, what does clean and articulate mean? You know, but, frankly, the media, looking for an opportunity to pounce on something, characterized it as Joe Biden being a little, if not racist, being you know, kind of obtuse um, in his use of the language to characterize Barack Obama. Um, and I will tell you guys that on that night when we announced our candidacy, our campaign was almost over before the day it began. Um, but Joe Biden was a pretty determined guy and he began his career as a civil rights lawyer um, and an advocate um, for social justice. And the people who knew him knew that he obviously didn't have a racist bone in his body. Um, and as that campaign went on and the debates went on and Joe Biden was able to demonstrate his character and who he was as a candidate and a person. When the campaign was over and Barack Obama was faced with the decision of who he picks as his running mate for vice president, 
he picked Joe Biden uh, to be his running mate. And obviously, they built a phenomenally successful partnership. Um, and we had eight years of uh, relative peace and prosperity um, under President Obama. Um, I think we forget just how sometimes, you know, almost blissful <laughs> life was under President Obama, how the world changed, how we all felt that, you know, we all belong together as a country. Um, I have this expression that I like to use, I like, you know, which is that Democrats win election when the country is united and Republicans win election, I hate to say it, Susan, when the country's divided. Um, and I would classify Donald Trump, obviously, as the divider in chief. Um, and uh, while there may have been, there was a Republican party, I think when the race began four years ago, and people thought that maybe it would be Jeb Bush or, Lindsey Graham or one of the more traditional candidates, I think Donald Trump has destroyed the Republican Party. And if we let him, he'll continue to destroy America. So I have a new job running Joe Biden's super PAC. So I am literally that guy in the smoke-filled room. So, um, but uh, in any case, um, I hope you'll all hear me out anyway tonight. And uh, thank you for having me. I, I love the story about Joe Biden because my, my political um, expertise is just that I was a diversity newspaper columnist. I have taught diversity. I have been trained in diversity. And um, the cancel culture would have eliminated uh, Joe Biden, but obviously Obama did not see that as a, a racist comment. And any of us can make a comment and then be you know, maligned out of a position because we've made a comment that maybe we weren't aware, we were ignorant or something like that. But So my name is Cheryl Owsley Jackson. I'm from Columbus, Indiana. And I always say I'm from Mike Pence's hometown. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I am from there. And um, I, have, I wrote the only diversity column that's ever been written in that newspaper. When I stopped writing it, it stopped being there. Um, it's Columbus, Indiana is 99 point something white and very middle class. And in many ways, it was a magical place to grow up. But I graduated with four other people of color, you know, and so in many ways, um, Columbus embraced the black people from there. You know, I grew up with the cops. I grew up with, we all know each other. And so I really thought that it was pretty wide-minded place because of the fact that, you know, I didn't experience prejudice there. Um, but it turns out that, you know, when I left and came back and they didn't know who I was. I mean, the younger cops didn't know me. So I did get pulled over and those kinds of things. But what I can tell you, I don't know what's going to happen in one year, but what I can tell you in three years, uh, in Columbus, Indiana, where Mike Pence was born and raised, where I was born and raised, where just a year uh, age difference, um, people will vote again for Trump and Pence. They have not changed at all. Um, I was in Columbus last week, and I heard a radio station. It was completely fake news, and it said that Nancy Pelosi had apologized and had said that this was an illegal act to, to impeach Trump, and they were quoting her, and it was just, I was trying to pull my car over and record it. I'm a reporter, right? So I was trying to pull over and record it. I didn't think anybody believed me, but then my friends were like, yeah, I heard, I've heard that. And so it's been heartbreaking for me in many ways because I'm half white from Columbus, Indiana, born in the 60s in a town where um, the Klan still marched through the streets whenever I was growing up. I mean, we didn't know who was behind the, the mask. Was it our teachers? Was it our doctors? Who was it? But I wrote this column, and I was embraced there in many ways. But um, um, in Columbus, Indiana, my friends and part of my family, they have voted for Trump. And so I, I have black friends who said, hey, you voted for a guy I consider racist. We're not friends anymore. And I really can't do that. I have a complicated relationship with um, many of the people in my community because they're very supportive of me and my family and um, those kind of things. So, my contribution tonight is not really about working on any political campaign, but what I can tell you is I was a conservative right-wing Christian. I grew up in a white church. Um, I grew up around a lot of conservatism. And, it, and I don't think it was because I was not woke. I was really actually living what I knew. It wasn't until I went to college and I went out and I started to learn different things about, um, you know, 
I, I mean, I voted for Obama, but I have to admit I voted Republican up until that point. So I think it gives me a little bit of a different perspective. Um, also, I do know that in Indiana, people vote based on abortion, based on not wanting uh, gay marriage, and also, Every cousin I have is a hunter. They do not want you to take her guns, right? So this is where it's all rooted in guns, um, in uh, abortion, and also in gay rights. And so um, I have a pretty good understanding of that. I'm a very liberal Christian at this point in my life and um, fully accepting of people. But I am concerned as the culture, as it moves on, as the, as the election moves on, because um, politicians are still doing commercials when, like we support our vice president and our president, you know, and they're wearing the hats. And, you know, I always say about the Jesse Smollett case, if he really wanted to get beaten up by people wearing those hats, I could have told him where to go. You know, he didn't have to do it in Chicago. <laughs> he could have driven four more miles, went out in the country, and then he would have been in trouble. So I, I think, I don't want to just bash Columbus because it was a place that really nourished and encouraged my life. Um, but I, I do have a complicated history there, and I am concerned because culturally I think, um, for a lot of Trump supporters, nothing's changed. I mean, they don't, they, they, he's right. He could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and not lose his voters. I see that. People that I know who are respectable, who would never say anything he said, who wouldn't put up with anyone acting the way he's acted in their homes, and they voted for him. So I don't understand it. But. Well, thank you, panelists, for your introduction. I have to start with the impeachment because we're in a very critical time in our country. And so I want you to maybe um, all of you can respond or if you feel so inclined, how important is it to Donald Trump's reelection that he um, weather this impeachment? And how important is it to the Democrats that they're successful at impeaching him um, to win 2020? Is it do you see the impeachment as critical to the success or failure of 2020 for the parties? Um, well, I think at this point, we have to see what happens in the public hearings. Because while we all may be very aware, American public is not all tuned into this. It won't happen until we hear the people who gave testimony that we've heard leaks about, until we hear them in front of, in front of the um, American public and what they have to say. The Democrats are doing a very good job about pr trying to lay out a case. They're going to be using professional staff, so it will look nothing like the hearings, whether it was Mueller or any of the other people that you've seen. It won't look like five minutes of boasting and then asking a, a nonsense question just to make themselves look good. It will actually be 45 minutes of, of real questioning and hearing what people have to say. And that's what Nancy Pelosi's bet on. Um, I think it goes to a lot of credibility for her, but at the same time, for Democrats at large, we're, di we're a divided country, so I can say the same thing for, for Donald Trump. It won't hurt him necessarily with his base, and that's all he has because he never did anything for the middle. He never went after independents or moderates. He's never tried to reach across the party aisle. So he's got his base and he's there. I think where the impeachment may play in is what was talked about earlier, a little bit on the primary, because you will have six senators who have to be at their desk listening to testimony because they will have to mm -hmm. decide how to vote. And that will leave a very interesting opening for, for Biden and Buttigieg especially, I think. That's where we'll see the, the big turn go in. And, and believe it or not, even like an Andrew Yang, because Andrew has, a lot of young support that Bernie Sanders has. I don't think that the support from Sanders goes to Warren. I actually think that if someone's going to drain off, it will be Andrew Yang because he keeps doing well and he has, a lot, he has enough money to go forward. But the impeachment news, I think the only thing that will truly affect not necessarily the parties as much is Donald Trump. I think he will go mad. Um, when he is impeached. He knows it right now. The only time between that's worse than from today until that vote happens is what happens in the Senate, and then he will completely unravel. But that's a very dangerous thing to have a president completely back on their heels, and all they're going to do is tweet all day. So the legislative ses you know, session is done. Nothing's going to happen, and Donald Trump will lose his mind once he's impeached. Sure. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I, I do think that if, you know, if they're not successful at impeaching him, it will just inspire his base. Wait, can, I'm sorry, would you mind saying, do you mean impeach 
or do you mean convict? Because I think we need to be very careful in those words, only because he will get impeached by the House, but he will not get convicted and thrown out of office. If, he's, not, if he's convicted and thrown out of office, I think that he will dog whistle like he does his base all the time. And if he gets thrown out of office, I think he could dog whistle chaos in the United States. I really do. Mm -hmm. I mean, he dog whistles racism all the time. He, you know, go back to your country when you're, I'm brown, but I'm from here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think that if he gets thrown out of office, I think he will dog whistle his base, and I think that we could have a problem on our hands. I mean, at least some violence. Impeachment, because if you remember, this issue has been sitting there basically since he got elected, um, and different Democrats said he needed to be impeached for a variety of things. But then you had that first debate and the first series of debates, and I watched Trump's poll numbers, his approval numbers, improve. And I said, what's going on here? And you were watching the Democrats all moving to the left. That's when health care was going to be given to everybody in the world or uh, you know anybody who came to this country. And I could see Trump's numbers going up, and we're not talking 50%, we're talking 45, 46, but he was starting to move up. And I said, the Democrats need a game changer, because if they're going to be talking about health care and these issues, it's going to help the president at this point, because the Democrats are not fixed on a health care policy. They are like the, Democrat, the Republicans back in 96 on taxes. They all have ideas, but n there's not a coalition on one policy, so it's confusing for voters. They're like, well, what are we going to do here on health care? So I thought it was a, tactically a good move by Pelosi to go to impeachment, because if we've noticed, every other issue that they've tried to hit the president on, from separating children from their parents and, and, and uh, his, his, his men all going to jail, it doesn't stick. It's like every week, every day, there's all these stories. With impeachment, it always comes back to impeachment. And we'll see if he's able to, how it all plays out. But I, I thought strategically it was the right move by the Democrats to bring up this issue. We'll see what happens with it. But if they were going to go down the other road, it was almost as if they were eating their own. And um, we'll see how, actually if they, they move forward. But I thought from a polling standpoint, it was the right move for the Democrats to make. And then we'll see how the Republicans can respond. Kathy. I think these are really good insights to, see, to think in terms of, as, as uh, uh, Susan has pointed out the possible reaction of Trump and how he would uh, color the situation and also the polling data. Um, I'm thinking of a, a program I heard this morning, Meet the Press, where they showed comparative uh, statistics on how the media and how the American people felt about impeachment in the Nixon impeachment and in the Clinton impeachment at this point in the impeachment trials. And like a, th a third of Americans uh, thought that it was a good idea, and the rest did not. Uh, so this whole thing, and, and, and uh, Susan has put her finger on it too, that uh, we have to see what the open hearings, what effect they might have on the American people, on us too, of what actually hearing these people testify rather than having it summarized for us in, in the uh, press, that would be very different. Uh, some, there are many, many figures in American history and American politics who have come to the fore because they've been head, the head of open hearings. I mean, thinking like Estes Kefauver was one of them. Harry Truman uh, was one of them. People who were chairing open hearings. Uh, and they, they were on radio or they were on television. And suddenly, people saw things in a very different way. And those people who were chairing them got great um, political advantage from having chaired them and being seen as the crime fighters. So I don't know if that will happen. We don't know. But it's an analogy to think about. But there is one thing that's different. And as a communication school, we, have to, we can't ignore it. Comparing it to Nixon or Clinton, guess what we didn't have? Fox. Cable TV. <laughs> and now people live in their silos. So we know that th there's, unlike Nixon and, and Clinton, you, there were three channels you watched. I mean, and it was news. It wasn't partisan. It was actually news. They, they gave you information. They didn't side with anyone. This was not a form of communi you know, spin communication. There weren't, late, there weren't hosts from 7 p.m. to midnight spinning whatever they want. So it'll be interesting to see what the day time says, no matter what station you're watching, compared to what most people turn into, which is a point of view show. 
in the evening. So I think that's the one thing that I just wonder how open people are going to do be because we watch our news in silos, and that's what is so dangerous right well, now. Just ask um, Spencer, where is the movement when you see movement and change? Is it um, in both parties, or is it mainly among the independents? Because the silos apply certainly, but there's. I'm it's, assuming that there's some movement among the independents. The but. movement is really on the issues. And what's been good for the Democrats in this impeachment is we're not talking about the wall. We're not talking about border. We're not talking about immigration. That was a very key issue for Trump. And that issue, we're not talking about it because every time things are going on, back to impeachment. And that impeachment is the elephant in the room. Now, we'll see. That might end up being you know, the paper tiger that you can't get off. But right now, I think it's a positive. Um, and I, you know, the partisanship is so strong that I, I agree with that point. In the polling, we ask him, if he's tried and not convicted, are you more or less likely to vote for him? It's fairly split. Um, it doesn't look like there's a huge loss or a huge gain on either side. So to me, it's a calculated good move. And it's switched the messaging of what we're talking about. And that's the key of what the media can do. They're not going to tell us, as Max McCombs would say, they're not going to tell us how to think, mm -hmm. but rather what to think about. And that's a very important thing for the Democrats and for the Republicans to try to fight over that messaging and agenda setting. And right now, I think that the Democrats have taken advantage of it because we're not talking about immigration. And that's, frankly, Trump's signature campaign issue. And that's kind of been now taken off the table for him. Um, and we'll see how that plays. <clears throat> so one, just one thing I do want to at least mention is so uh, over the, the reason we started the super PAC for Joe Biden is because over the last month or so, um, Trump and his allies have spent $10 million in negative advertising against Joe Biden, um, principally in the battle in the you know, early states, um, and principally around the very subject that the impeachment hearing is going to be about, which is what actually happened in Ukraine. So for us, at least, the impeachment hearings, to some extent, is a continuation of what we've been witnessing over the last month, which is that this is really the beginning of the general election campaign. And Biden is really in the position of trying to fight a dual front war, competing in the primary. At the same time, Trump is trying to win the, you know, compete in the general election. In fact, the head of the RNC said, we expect Joe Biden to be out of this race by November. That is our goal. And you know, so our goal as we go through the impeachment hearings is frankly to make sure that that doesn't happen and that we're you know, leveling the playing field in terms of you know, the, the way that whole narrative is playing out and in the advertising that's going on. I do want to come back to the insurrection issue because I think that's going to be, that, that is something that I think is going to be underlying this campaign. It is going to be, as Susan said, this is going to be hideously ugly. Um, you know, Donald Trump has shown that he can find cracks in the sidewalk that only he can find, you know, places to get, you know, lower than anybody else. So I do worry that he is going to try and inspire the base. And, um, but I do agree generally that um, with the idea that Trump will be impeached in the House, but he will not be convicted mm -hmm. in the Senate. I do not think that the Republicans will break in the Senate. So everybody is going to have to figure out how, what is their definition of victory, you know, coming out of these hearings, and how does the narrative play out for the American people? And not the 35% that is, you know, the Trump base, which is, you know, kind of my number, but, you know, for, you know, the voters that, frankly, Nancy Pelosi was most concerned about the voters in the swing states that gave her back control of the House and that are going to be watching this. And, you know, at least, I, and, and it may be different, but God, I do, rem I'm old enough to remember being mesmerized by the Watergate hearings. And the fact that this is going to be televised, 
Um, and again, to Susan's point, which I think is a, a great one, Donald Trump will do nothing but watch TV during those <laughs> hearings, and he will go mad. Um, and that will be the most sort of, that's the most interesting part of the whole thing is how, how, how does that manifest itself? I think it's pretty clear that uh, Donald Trump has demonstrated to us that he sees Joe Biden as the chief rival by the attacks that he's making, the investigation with the Ukraine. Uh, does this create an opportunity for another candidate to kind of sneak underneath the radar and do some type of stealth type of campaign while Joe is on defense uh, in Ukraine? Is this advantageous to one, particularly the primary candidates, or another? Are you asking me? Or yeah. <laughs> well, well, certainly they are all trying. I mean, obviously Warren and Sanders have their place on the game board. That is not, you know, they're, they're not stealth candidates. They have mm -hmm. their own lane and their own narrative and their own supporters. Obviously, Pete is, you know, having his moment. Now, you know, I, you know, I have to confess that uh, I'm a little skeptical, but I do think Pete's an impressive candidate, but I would remind people that at this point in 2007, Barack Obama was at 22% in the polls, not 9% in the polls, and Hillary was at 27, and John Edwards was in between, so the idea, uh, and I actually think at the end of this, um, Susan mentioned Andrew Yang, I think he's gonna make some noise, you know, over the next month and couldn't um, be that surprised. I think Amy, obviously, um, uh, she had a great debate, she's gonna be formidable in Iowa, and, uh, you know, so if there, uh, I think we haven't, you know, seen the last of her. Mm -hmm. so. But we also know that the fact that you have a, that Biden now has a super PAC, which he originally said he wasn't going to do or support. I have no problem with, by the way, uh, maybe it's because I'm a consultant. Um, <laughs> could be that. No, I mean, just the concept of having a super PAC. But I think to the, can someone slip in? There's also another thing at play here, and that's money. And a lot of candidates have a lot of money. When I say a lot, I mean, <coughs> We, Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, he has $19 million on hand. Why is he going up in the polls in Iowa, which is a caucus state, which is all organization? He's been putting resources there. He's also been putting a lot of resources in New Hampshire. But, so we talk about Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, as everyone's talking about, and is there room for Biden if he falls in third in one of these, can he survive? I say, who can have enough money to go into Super Tuesday, especially if Kamala Harris drops out? Because now you're talking big bucks. You're talking Texas, you're talking California, which costs a fortune in those media markets. So being, uh, being able to survive financially is equally a big thing in this race that I don't think we've ever seen at, at this level. Because by the time they went to Iowa, New Hampshire, it, really just kind of settled in. It'd be a two or three person race. We still may be seeing five or six people who are got the cash to go. Yeah. And it's unlikely that we're in this scenario, but we're in the scenario where Trump's been campaigning since he was elected for office. And so he's been going the, doing the rallies. How important is it for um, the Democrats to rally behind whoever the candidate is. I mean, there's such divisiveness, and the, the candidates are trying to create, as Dr. Kendall noticed, trying to create uh, some unconventional policies to draw attention to themselves, but that can only go so far, right? Um, is it, and do the Democrats have to resolve that they're going to support whoever comes to the, um, through the primary in order to uh, challenge uh, Trump, or is there a potential that a third party candidate comes in? Well, if a third yeah. party comes in on the left, that's going to make it really difficult to beat mm -hmm. Trump. Uh, kind of saw that last time. Uh, even like a Gary Johnson type of candidacy, it gives reason for somebody, if they don't like the Democrat the candidate, just to give, they want to vote, they just don't want to vote for that person. Um, in, in to the money situation, I just wanted to bring that back. Remember, there was a lot of heat given to Obama in 08 when he opted out of public financing. Yeah. 
but he won. And so people thought, hey, you know what? That was a good decision. And same thing with Biden. You know, if you're going to have to play in this game, you need the money to play. And so you might take the heat in the primary, and, and Obama did, but he wins the general. I think what's interesting about a guy like Pete, Mayor Pete, is when we watch him in the debates, he's talking about God. He's talking about going to church. He reminds me, and you can correct me, but probably like Jimmy Carter back in 76, a very... Um, very Christian, very, very religious. And you say, well, how's that going to play in the Democratic Party? Um, I say it's going to play OK. Because as I watch in Iowa, where is Mayor Pete's strongest position in Iowa? It's up in the northwest area of the state. That is Stephen King's district. That is a district that Trump wins by 30 points. The other districts, one, two, three, those are competitive districts. Uh, those are all a couple of points either way. But that, third, that fourth district, very strong. And when I look at our poll numbers and I see Mayor Pete doing well in the fourth district, not those other ones, it tells me there is no Republican challenge. Who's to say he can't pull out a group of voters out of Iowa and use that as a springboard, launching board? Now, to Larry's point, we've seen the national polls. Pete is not there. He's not Obama of 08. I think he's running more of a Carter type of race, really under the radar, looking for that one magical moment in Iowa and push him if he's spending the money in New Hampshire and he's got the money. The question is, is, can, is that enough to then get to Nevada and South Carolina dealing with more diverse populations? Remember, Iowa, New Hampshire, 90, 95% white. We get into uh, uh, Nevada, and that's why they were moved up into the system. Now, is that a firewall for Biden? But these are all, to me, very exciting to watch in that first month of the nominating process. You know, March, or, uh, February 3rd is the uh, Iowa caucuses. A month later is this Kilimanjaro. This is the, yeah. uh, the uh, Super Tuesday. But then following that, if you, if you survive that somehow, I think the following week, next two weeks, are like 14 more Democratic primaries. It is just daunting. But the, the, that's why this winning thing is so central. And I think the focus, can they win one of these, or two of these, or three of these, or come in second or something in those first four. Because then the money will come in. And, and because winning is so crucial, it's always crucial. It's the only thing that everyone wants. But this time, people are saying, I would vote for any of them. Is, you know, there, there's a kind of a commitment in answer to your question. Yes, we would vote for any of them, even though we much prefer this one. But at least that's, at least that's what people are saying. We don't know whether they'll act, act on it. But to throw a monkey wrench into your question, you said, will they get behind the nominee? What makes you think getting a nominee is going to be so easy the way everything's laid out? You're talking about these are not winner-take-all states, yes. folks. You're talking about 450 delegates in, in California alone. They're not all going to somebody. If you don't think Bernie Sanders is going to get, even if he's in third place, get a hundred, like he will, he will do well there. There are certain states that they are going to do well in, and if 2016 is any indication, 2020 is going to be much harder because it won't just be Bernie Sanders going to this convention with delegates. It's going to be Elizabeth Warren. It's going to be Pete Buttigieg. It may be Cory Booker. There will be a coalition to be done. And the hardest thing that the Democrats are going to have at that convention is, who brokers it? I mean, for real. And a, and a, and a point to that <laughs> is in, well, in 2016. Uh, if he, if he, he, if he, I don't know if he'll do it. In 2016, there was 20% of the delegates were on Super Tuesday. In 2020, because of California, it's about 33%, which means there's more horses in the race to take those delegates. And to your point, there's no super delegates on the first count. So back in 08 and 2016, you know, oh, Clinton's got 500 delegates in the bag. We don't have 500 delegates in the bag right now. And so that rule change could open up that opportunity if these horses stay in there. And then we could have something to talk about in uh, about the conventions. In June, early June, there, well, I don't know the exact date, but there's a, uh, there are four primaries in early June that are significant. Uh, so it's going to go, it could go to the very end. I was just going to say a little something about Buttigieg. I was talking to Spencer about today, about him going out and talking about God and maybe some of the Christian, the conservative Christians, maybe voting for him. You know, he was saying he thought so. And I thought, I... I would just be so shocked by this. He's my favorite candidate in the race, but I would just be so shocked if uh, the Indiana girl. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I would. I would be shocked if, huh? 
Indiana did vote for Obama. It's true, barely. But yeah, it was way into the night. But, um, but I, I would be surprised. And I honestly feel, just from my perspective, that the people that we need to leave the Trump campaign in order to vote a Democrat in, are they going to vote for a woman, a black person, or someone who is gay? And I really don't think they will. I mean, I that's just my... I think you need the voters who didn't show up last time well, and all the well, new yeah. voters that are being registered now. I mean, when you, I, I just did a quick look at Pennsylvania 2016 to, to, to May 2019. They were growing at five and a half, six percent on the Democrat side, which translates into hundreds of thousands of voters. They were grown by two percent for Republicans. They can't find new Republican voters, which is their whole game plan you saw right that now. In the midterms. And yeah, you saw it in the midterms. They have to find so Trump can keep most of his voters. Can he keep all the evangelicals? Yeah, though? he I can mean, keep can we, them. He we can don't need let them though? have it. But if let's not forget when we talk about three states, you're talking about twenty two thousand here, you're not talking about not showing up in parts of Michigan. We're talking about Florida now, post Puerto Rico which is a whole different game changer because you have a, lot, a different group of people coming in and registering to vote mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico. Now, in in I mean, I'm sorry, in Florida, excuse me. And that, that can make a difference if they can build coalitions with the Haitians and other groups to, to really go after targeted um, folks in the general election, which Trump is already trying to do. I mean, he has definitely broken it out in social media. But I don't think you need to flip many Trump voters, because I also think a lot of them will just stay home. Like, I know a lot of Republicans who will never vote for Donald Trump. They may not vote for Elizabeth Warren, but they will not be voting for Donald Trump. And my Republicans I know are all going to vote for him again. Yeah. You know, and, it, so. and it's interesting, because I think to get around that, the, at least in the state level, we're witnessing in Virginia, every day I get a direct mail piece about abortion. And so they're driving that issue because they realize we've got to get the conservative voters to the polls because if, if they're not going to turn out for Trump, we need to get them for some other reason. Um, and so I think they're being strategic like that. If you, can if I we, just say, sure. I, I do want to just remind people that going back to the why did Barack Obama pick Joe Biden? So there were three reasons. One, because he thought he won, Biden won all the debates, interestingly enough, in 2007. And by the way, the one real job of a vice presidential nominee is to win that debate in the general election, and which is unfortunate, unfortunately why Tim Kaine you know, failed in his mission. But the second reason was because people were skeptical of Obama's um, foreign policy experience, his national security credentials, and Joe Biden gave him that. And if there was ever a time, by the way, where those credentials are going to be paramount, it's going to be in this election. But the third reason is because Joe Biden gave Barack Obama those ethnic, you know, blue collar, you know, white voters in Pennsylvania, Michigan, you know, um, the upper Midwest. And, you know, I know you said Pete is doing great in the, in the northwest section of the state. Joe Biden will always be the strongest in Dubuque and the northeast part of Iowa where all the Catholics are. And, um, and that is still, you know, at the end of the day, where Democrats are, and you look at the, the, if there's one thing the polls are clear about, is that Joe Biden is the one Democrat who people feel can beat Donald Trump, and um, by a mile. And at the end of the day, I mean, my humble opinion, when they have to go to the polls and they really look themselves in the eye, they're gonna say, I, I love all these other people, or I love, you know, Medicare for all, but I cannot live with, you know, another four years of Donald Trump. And again, Biden repeated that in 18 when he campaigned across Pennsylvania. If there was one candidate that everybody was, wanted to have campaigning for them, it was Joe Biden. And you put Joe Biden on the top of the ticket, you don't lose a single congressional race. You put anybody else on the top of the ticket, who's in this field, and it gets very squishy. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, again, I know he's old. I know it's not, you know, the coolest candidate out there, except, except when he puts his shades on. But he, <laughs> he, he, is, he is the guy who is uh, going to be the nominee. Now, I will say, just to, uh, not to go on and on, but when we get to the convention, I do think it's going to be tricky because I think of what, because of what happened to Bernie the last time, there is going to be tremendous pressure on Joe, if he's the nominee, to pick one of the, you know, progressive candidates um, and put them on the ticket. And that is going to be a challenge. The Biden coalition right now is our older white voters. African Americans and Latinos, where Biden is doing great, um, and um, but you know we are going to have to have a reconciliation with the left, unlike Hillary did, and and that may have cost her the election. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm going to turn over to um, audience questions in a moment, but before I do, I want to get to you all to speculate. I think we're pretty clear where, where you stand on who's going to be a nominee. But if the rest of you to speculate at this point, who do you think is going to be the Democratic nominee? And if you feel confident, uh, who would be the, the perfect running mate? I think a dream team might be Biden and Buttigieg <laughs> myself, but I don't think, I, again, I don't think a woman, a gay man or a black person is going, to, I don't, I just don't think America's ready for that again, so. Interesting. Well, they were ready for Barack Obama, so I'm not sure I agree with you. I kind of feel like Obama is the, is the reason Trump was elected. I think there are people in my community that, you know, were like, they were not comfortable with a with a black man being, you know, in that position. I think uh, sometimes I think Trump is the personification of the rage and the anger they felt because of Barack Obama. So that's just mm -hmm. my thinking. Uh, you, it's probably true, but very scary. Mm -hmm. so. so you're going with Biden, huh? Well, <laughs> he can't pick himself as the running. I put mate. that in your mouth. Uh, Maybe not. Right. And I cannot. I cannot speculate on the running mate because that's his. Yeah. If I do that, I'll get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have a hard time trying to figure out who's going to win this primary right now. Mm -hmm. I'm really stuck. But if I had to think of a combo that would probably work very well and kind of tick off all the boxes on the, on the Democratic side and for some independents and people would be Biden and Harris because Kamala brings, you know, they've had that knockout at the beginning. So it would look good to bring in, kind of unite. She's younger. She does, I mean, when she handles her, so when you see her, she really does a great job in, in representing not just herself, but kind of the ideas of a generation. And she would kick butt in, in a debate. So if you use that as a decision, except I'm not willing to say that would be, that Biden would win the primary. But I think he would, if he did, he would go with that kind of ticket. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I, the primary is going to be tough. I think there's a shifting sand underneath us on the Democratic side. And while we sit there and think Joe Biden might be most electable, if I was sitting here in 1972, I would say Ed Muskie is the most electable candidate, and he didn't he didn't make it through um, because there wasn't energy. How did that and, work? Well, <laughs> the the issue that I have with Biden is is the energy, at least that I see on the online platforms, and that's not necessarily real energy True. because, like, we watched Andrew Yang create from a bot farm. Um, to a real group of supporters. We watched it on the Emerson poll. Every time we put out a poll, we got six responses, very similar. Now we get a lot of, because he's actually built out an online organization. Mm -hmm. So my concern with Biden is, is that energy factor when that first vote comes out in Iowa, does he have the organization in place, um, or is there a big upset that happens that totally throws the race out of, out of whack? Um, though I don't think it's Andrew Yang, and we go back <laughs> no, to George yeah. McGovern. It was McGovern's $1,000 uh, plan, so Yang is kind of rehashing that. But Yang pulls that vote directly from Bernie Sanders. So if Yang does do better, Sanders is in big trouble. Um, my thought for the general election early on was, you get Biden, you double down with a Sherrod Brown, another white male from the Midwest, to try to offset the, the, the um, 
the, the Trump support. But then I was watching the Louisiana uh, primary a couple weeks ago. We pulled these races. Kentucky, we're going to be watching that tomorrow, Mississippi. And what I noticed was in that Alabama special election in Doug Jones and Roy Moore, huge turnout of African-American voters. They were up like 3% over. That did not happen in Louisiana, and that's why there's a runoff. That African-American vote lost some energy between the Roy Moore race and Doug Jones to where we are now. And the question will be, can they get that energy back? And I think your point to Harris might be the appropriate one, or, or Booker, where African-Americans need to see an African-American. Because if we remember Barack Obama, he did great in 08, got 70 million votes. Nobody's ever gotten 70 million votes since, or before. But what happened in 2010? What happened in 2014? When you're not on the top of the ticket, he was unable to pull that vote. So I, I'm on the fence now. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're going to watch these races this week and see what happens in these population points to see where that energy is to, to get them over the finish line. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say with absolute firmness that the uh, nominee will not be either Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren because the nominee will be somebody who's for uh, Medicare for all who want it. I'm, I'm sure of that. I think that the, with two thirds of the Americans already having health insurance, it's too risky to go with a candidate who wants something different. So, th so rather than choosing a candidate, I'm just going to say the two, those two front runners, uh, I think are out of it. And so that would leave the others, and I, any one of the others, and I would say that either the president or vice presidential candidate for the Democrats will be a Midwesterner. I think that the Midwesterners have made an excellent case in the debates for why they should be chosen. Whether it's president or not, the two who have spoken most about this have been Klobuchar and Buttigieg, that one of those two will be either president or vi vice presidential candidate uh, next time. So I've, I've also avoided making a choice because I'm with the majority of, of Democrats who, who said the primary race is still up in the air. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. right. Well, uh, audience members, questions? Yes. He's my student. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, because um, <laughs> why not? Um, I think that what, what's interesting about the timetable is that Nancy Pelosi also doesn't want to be known as a spoiler in this race for six potential nominees. And so she does want to let the Senate get this wrapped up. But from a practical point of view and from a communication scope, I think they should do it quickly as well because the message is so simple to me, which is Donald Trump, use his influence to meddle in the 2020 election, full stop. If they could keep that message, to kind of go to your second part of your question, if they can get that, that message down and have everything else building up for it, so impeachment or not, it allows them to go forward with something that they could, everyone can still wrap their, arm, their, their minds around because most people think he did do something wrong, even if it's not impeachable, that's a whole separate issue. So that issue of him meddling, rigging the, turning it around, rigging the system against Americans by going to a foreign power, that, that or, or country, I should say, I don't know how much of a power they are, but um, <laughs> it's Ukraine. So um, I think that that's their message, but I think they need to knock it out early because if they keep going on with these hearings, it's going to get muddled. They have some great witnesses. They're already doing the hearings because Nancy Pelosi thinks they have it. So if they got it, go with it, 
and end it because going too fast, people don't, what, what, it's more noise. I just, I got to shop for Christmas. I got to return presents. You know, like, I can't be bothered. And give me the facts. And that's what they have to do in a very concise manner. Average American is too busy to attend to politics the way we do in this room, uh, and so they're looking for easy answers to the get. Th and this is not going to be easy if the nightly news is leading with impeachment, and then in the background are the the primary elections. Uh, the it's it's going to be a scary scenario. Uh, other questions? I'm happy to yeah. give you another answer. Too. Oh, did you want? Yes, sir. We go right to James Carville's you know, mantra, it's the economy, stupid, and people worry about pocketbook issues. And what we see in the polling is, for a third of voters in every state, the economy is the number one issue. Then we can get into health care, then we can get into uh, immigration, we can get into gun policy, we can get into education, lots of different issues. And we all have these issues, but the economy does have a plurality support in all of these in every state. And so it does come down to that. Um, for a lot of voters, and that's something that the Democrats have to consider, and I thought Elizabeth Warren on her Medicare for All proposal, it was important that she didn't double down on Bernie Sanders that I'm going to raise your taxes, because that I don't think is a winner, um, and I don't think even being honest and truthful in that regard is a, is a winner, um, is even to try to make it look authentic. So to me, it was good for her to be able to shift and move that um, policy, but that's a, it's a real concern, and her her narrative as, you know, busting up the banks in Wall Street, that's, that's something that I think we've talked about as a concern and why I think Larry thinks that Biden is so necessary as the nominee because in that general election against Trump, he can battle with him on the economy and not say, uh, Trump can't say, well, Biden said he's going to raise your taxes because Biden doesn't say that. Um, he's going to be able to say that against some of the other candidates. I would also remind, you know, say that you know, Biden obviously will campaign on the fact that you know they passed the Recovery Act when he and Obama took over, and you know that Biden literally single-handedly you know turned you know Arlen Specter's vote around and you know got the stimulus bill through. So I mean, I, I do think you know it's interesting. I it, I just happened to watch uh, the movie The Big Short last night. And um, it reminded me, I mean, and, you know, if you guys haven't seen it, it's definitely worth seeing. But it reminded me just how quickly everything came undone, you know, in 2008. And I, I, I do think, you know, if you're, if, if, we think, you know, we're fine. I mean, but a year from now, you know, there's, a, there's so many structural issues. And, and Trump is such a ham-handed moron, if you don't mind me saying, you know, playing around with these trade issues that, um, you know, China pulls the plug on our debt, you know, Wall Street. I mean, and, and I will remind people that if Lehman Brothers had collapsed two weeks earlier, and John McCain decided to pick Mitt Romney instead of Sarah Palin. You know, we might have had a very different future in terms of 
you know, who won that election. So, you know, but if Wall Street collapses again and Elizabeth Warren is the nominee, you know what? You might end up with a wealth tax. <laughs> and uh, so um, your friends may be running the, you know, uh, the Cayman Islands or something. <laughs> but, uh, One more question, yeah. So hi, I'm Matthew Grady. Um, and I just kind of wanted to ask how is President Donald Trump kind of reformatted the Republican Party? And this, will we see this kind of shift continue? And also, what will we be remembered by for this first term that he's had? Because there's been so many things, everything he said. So I was just wondering if you knew one specific thing that will kind of like uh, be his title for his first term. Impeachment. <laughs> I, I mean, that's chaos. as big as it gets. But as probably the only Republican, you're former Republican. Yeah, I'm former. Former Republican. I'm still a I Republican. Issues, though, you know, I know. So. But um, Donald Trump owns the party right now because he owns the elected officials. Um, and he does that by having a, the, the base of the party is much more to the right. Come into the middle. I, I, I always ran races where... I would, the Republicans had to be moderate because they needed Democrats to get elected. They were never in a Republican majority district. So that's how they got elected, was being moderate. And the seats we used to go back and forth, DR, DR, DR. But good policy would come out of it. People ask me why I'm still a Republican, given especially my feelings towards President Trump. And I tell them because right when he leaves office, I will be finding Republican candidates to primary all the knucklehead Republicans who backed him. So yes, I do think that there is a party after Trump, and only Trump can be Trump and, and influence it, and I do think the fact that he will be impeached will hurt him as far as mental, you know, personally and with the party, as what, how effective he could be in endorsements after the election. I, um, I, I think that he will be remembered for um, the way the country is divided, and I'm not sure we can go back. I'm really not. And I also, for someone who was a diversity worker for decades, I mean, um, somebody who thought they were making a difference, I think that Trump made it politically correct to, to, to expose your prejudice and your bias. And, uh, and so now we live in a world that I didn't even realize I lived in. I mean, I, I grew up around prejudice, but um, this new heightened exposure of people who will just, I mean, you see the YouTubes of someone just standing there calling someone the N-word or you know, throwing something at someone because they have on a hijab or something like that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we can go back, and I, I think we have to realize that it's not a resurgence of racism, it's an expose, it's, it's a new exposure to something that we thought politically correct before. In the 80s, it was very politically correct. Everybody wanted to have me come do diversity training because they wanted to set, they wanted, they bought into the idea that if you have a diverse group of people working on something, then you have a you know a diverse pool of ideas that makes it better. But I do think that um, a lot of those people, some of those people I worked with in Columbus and worked with in Indianapolis and throughout my life, a lot of those people um, kind of were able to say, you know, I don't I don't like Muslims, I don't really like black people, you know. So um, I don't think we can go back. I think this is a change, a shift in our country and our culture that I that I think we're gonna have trouble recovering from. Okay. Well, I would like for, um, we've gonna stop it here, but I'd like to have you join me in giving the panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and, 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 and there is a reception in the next room, so if you still have burning questions, uh, I invite you to <laughs> approach our panelists with those uh, in uh, the next room. Thank you very much.